ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानं जनशलाकाय चक्षुर मिलितम् येन तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः There are several important topics that I wish to cover this evening. Important means as they practically apply to our progress in Krishna consciousness. As many of you know, I'm reading many of the writings and transcribed lectures of Śrīla Bhakti Siddhānta Sāsvara Thakko one theme he often elaborates on is understanding bhakti as it is as distinguished from what may appear to be bhakti he spoke on this elaborately now what are we to be understand by this bhakti what appears to be bhakti surely bhakti is bhakti another topic a related topic that he spoke of was a need to properly define words because this word bhakti who knows this word bhakti who has heard this word bhakti before you all heard the word bhakti right you all know what bhakti means you all know what bhakti means You've all heard this word since you're about four or five years old, right, Bhakti? So you all know what it means. Well, if we knew what it meant, we wouldn't be in this material world. <laughs> what we think is Bhakti is many cases not Bhakti. What, the common understanding of the word Bhakti, what, what, what do you think that is? Let, let's try and think. What, when we say Bhakti to the common pious Hindu, what does he understand by that? Who would like to give some suggestions? Mostly they think it is pious. <laughs> Mostly think of it as some piety. But, but what, what actually is, when they say bhakti, what do they mean? Mostly it's some kind of feeling, isn't some it? Some attachment to some God. At some, some, but especially, it can be to not just attachment, but it should be some emotional feeling for some God, emotion. some ecstasy, and there should be some arati and some singing. This <coughs> is all part of bhakti. It's all bhakti, right? There's also desh bhakti. People have defined it as that. That uh, love your country. It's been redefined. So bhakti is generally considered as some kind of feeling for a god. And it's often the mayavad, not often, but pretty much always, the mayavad understanding that you have feeling for some god and gradually as you as you do bhakti then you become more advanced and then you become eligible for gyan and then you understand that you are god so the mayavadi understanding of bhakti which is more or less all pervading in hindu society is not bhakti at all it's just the opposite of bhakti it's it's not just only the opposite of bhakti it's worse than just being the opposite of Opposite of bhakti is Hiranyakashipu, Ravan, Ityadi. But worse than Hiranyakashipu is Putana, who came in the form of a bhakta, but her intention was to kill her. Hiranyakashipu, he had the, he had the quality of being straightforward. It's not, straightforwardness in hating God is not good. But it's better than Putana who wanted to kill Krishna. She was showing great bhakti. Oh, nice child, I want to feed. But her intention was to kill. So the Mayavadi's concept of bhakti is that, yes, you love Krishna and it's very good. You chant Krishna or Ganesh or whatever you call it. And it can be anything, but Krishna is a good object of bhakti because it's Krishna's, the Krishna concept of God is very good for developing bhakti. All these atheistic things they say. So they think this is very good and then you, you develop bhakti and you hear about the gopis and it's all very good and then eventually you understand soham. I am that God. Jitna ji vitna shiv. All the jivas are shiva and all this. So it's not actually bhakti. Uh, and another uh, 
That that's the Mayavadi or the Jnana Kandi understanding of bhakti. And then there's the Karma Kandas, Karma Kandi understanding of bhakti, in which that you worship the God in whichever form you. Just like this question comes, who is your Ishta Devata? This idea comes that well, you have to worship some God. So you worship. For you, God is Krishna, and for me, God is Ganesh, and for me, God is Ganesh on Mondays and Ram on Tuesday and Sai Baba on Wednesday. Because God is just some undefined concept, and you just whatever you feel like, to, according to your mood, you can take God like that. So these are all rascal Mayavadi ideas, and if you don't understand, if you feel offended by that, then uh, please read Bhagavad Gita as it is very carefully many times. We're all influenced by this Mayavad. The Karma Kandya approach is um, more like that, well, God's some guy out there somewhere, let him stay out there, but he has to bless me with. And blessing, that's why so many, so many times people come ask me for blessings. They say, what blessing do you want? Blessing means dhanam dehi, rupam dehi, yasham dehi. Give me all the material benefits. So God is some powerful being, we don't want to define him too clearly, who gives material benefits. So bhakti means you worship God for material benefits and eventually come to the level of jnana and understand I am God. So people from Hindu backgrounds who take to Krishna consciousness there is a difference coming from Hindu and non-Hindu background we're all influenced by our cultural upbringing that's another problem and the, the Western devotees they have other problems and they, have, they have the problem of their cultural upbringing which is worse than the Indian one or the Hindu one but uh, the Hindu one is bad enough <laughs> so we're discussing that it has its advantages and disadvantages. Hindu upbringing in general, it's good in the sense that there should be respect for sadhus and respect for Bhagavad Gita. But there are problems with it also. Just like people come and they think, oh, this is a bhakti movement. And they, oh, that's very nice. I need to it'd be nice to have some bhakti. And unless we define very clearly, at that point I was saying, Bhakti Stan was saying, we need to define all these words very clearly. Bhakti, avatar, Siva, Vairagya. Otherwise, unless we define it very clearly, I'm to, so we, I may be saying to someone that, yes, we should have bhakti for Krishna. And they'll say, yes, yes, they'll agree. But they'll have a completely different understanding. And they'll be, Mayava, we may go to so many Mayavadis and say that we should increase our bhakti for Bhagavan. And they'll agree, say, yes, that's wonderful. That We believe that also. And they do. But their understanding of what is bhakti and what is Bhagavan is completely different. So first of all, we have to understand. We have to clearly define when we when we say bhakti, what is the meaning of that? When we say bhagavan, what is the meaning? Bhagavan doesn't mean that some concept that we develop our devotion to, so that we can eventually understand. There's no bhagavan. There's no bhakta. There's no. There's nothing. Everything is nothing. It's the Mayavadi misconcept. So for first of all we have to clearly understand what we are talking about, clearly define it otherwise so many problems will come in the name of bhakti Most, mostly bhakti as it's conducted in general Hinduism there's what's called the, the bhakti sampradayas that, that people, people that, well there's the jnanis like the Shankaracharyas and the Ram Krishna mission well, the Ram Krishna mission is it's a fusion of bhakti and jnana. That's the idea. That, that Ram Krishna Paramahamsa was a great bhakta, but at the same time the highest jnani. And in this way, he's he, the greatest expression of Hinduism. Uh, all all bhakti and jnana combined. Of course, Prabhupada pointed out that uh, in Bhagavad Gita it stated that by worship, worship of demigods is foolishness. Karma is tai sai hrita jnana prapadyante devataha. So how by worship of demigods can you become self-realized or how, himself thinking or how can you become God? You cannot become God. There are so many mistakes. So many mistakes in the, in the, in the Ram Krishna mission and its preaching. So many. Prabhupada wrote that 
that even Shankaracharya, whose philosophy was bad enough, even he would be disgusted to see what the, what, what's going on in his name in, in the, by Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. Neo Vedanta, they call it, as if Vedanta can be up. up you know what Neo means? It means like modern version. So it's as if Vedanta has to be upgraded or adjusted to the modern age. So, um, in Hinduism, it's generally considered that, well, there's the Gani Sampradaya and there's the Bhakti Sampradaya, and they're like the, the, the Bhaktas. And the Mayavadis, they're, they're always trying to pull it in and say, well, it's all one. And some of the Bhaktas, the real Bhaktas, they stand against Mayavad. Traditionally, the Ramanuj Sampradaya and Madhva Sampradaya, they're st- very strongly against uh, Mayavad. The, the Mayavad means thinking everything is all one. I am you and you are me and we are all together and all this kind of thing. So, the, but uh, nowadays you'll find most of the supposed followers or the, this, the, the, the Ayangas and they're all worshipping Sai Baba or the so-called Kalki Avatar or complete nonsense. They've, they've become completely compromised. So, how did that happen? After so many generations of being staunchly against Mayavada, how did that happen? Because they stopped teaching. They stopped teaching the, the, the philosophy, which is supposed to be taught generation after generation, and it just became that, well, we, we go to Tirupati and we, we put something in the Hundial, uh, or we go to, we, or we go to, uh, Sri Rangam, or we, we sing some, uh, or we recite some Divya Prabandhas and, we listen to the explanation, which is all good, that's that's all very good. But if you only recite the Divya Prabandham, but we don't also have the philosophical drilling to, to distinguish between what is actual bhakti and what is cheating in the name of bhakti and what is mayavad, then you, within one or two generations, you'll never mind your teaching Divya Prabandham, you'll lose everyone to Sai Baba and this and that because you don't know why we're worshipping why we're doing what we're doing and therefore in the name of bhakti most of the so-called bhakti sampradaya now we're t- I'm just talking about the real sampradaya Ramanuja and Madhva Madhvas are still pretty staunch we don't find many of them becoming Mayavadis they just become anyway um, but what happens is that in the name of bhakti it, be, it mostly becomes a form of entertainment for the sake of la puja pratishta. The, those they're well-known speakers, and they speak very nicely about Krishna Leela and they sing some songs on harmonium with the harmonium, and sing very sweetly, and they may recite some shastra also. And people come back and they say, "Well, that was really nice. I really enjoyed it. That means he must be a great bhakta, and I'm also a great bhakta." And we measure bhakti by how much we enjoy it. That he sang very nicely and I enjoyed it. And this is bhakti, you see. We, I felt great emotion in my heart. And it was wonderful. And they even gave uh, such a well-organized program, they even had mufta chai saver. <laughs> see, because that's real bhakti. Serving the you see, all the bhaktas they organized for them. You understand that? Free tea for one and all. So, they, they measure, because bhakti is a feeling, because we have not been trained to understand that bhakti means rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ruchate. The conditioned soul thinks that everything is meant for my sense gratification and Bhagavan is also meant for my sense gratification that's why people they say well I was following your Hare Krishna I had so many problems in my life and I went to your Hare Krishna and I still had more problems actually increased then I went to Sai Baba and everything became better so that proves Sai Baba is the actual God because he works for my sense gratification so the, the, the mentality of the conditioned soul is so seriously diseased that he thinks that even Bhagavan is meant for my sense gratification. And bhakti, that's also for me. If, if I feel it's nice and I liked his singing and he sings very sweetly 
and very nice songs and we heard very nice songs about how Krishna is still in the bhakti and I really enjoyed it and that's the son this is bhakti and I'm a, he's a great bhakti because he made me feel good but a real bhakti doesn't try to make others feel good he acts for the pleasure of Krishna and if in the course of doing so he might make people feel bad still he has to do so just like nowadays if Hanuman was to attack Ravana they'd bring in they bring in a United Nations, they try to have some United Nations conference, and they try to say, you know, Ravan Kobi Kushkan Nahay. You know, he's also, we should listen to his opinion and what Ravana has to say. He's also a human being, and maybe he made a little mistake of sealing Sita, but, you know, after all, he's not such a bad person. That's what they try to do, because everything's good and everything's nice. But Hanuman didn't go to any such peace committee. He didn't listen to Ravan's opinion. Because Hanuman, he's not a fool. He knows that Ram is the supreme personality of God. And Ram's, Ravan's a rascal. He doesn't have any dvidha in his mind. He doesn't have any, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should sit with Ravana and, you know, talk it out. He didn't do any such thing. <laughs> he did, let's have a win win policy. There's no such thing. The win-win policy, Ram wins and I win and we kick Ravan in the head. That's, that was Hanuman's win-win policy. So, so uh, it's very clear, Ravan is a demon. It's not that, the, the, these Mayavadis, they preach that, well, everyone is good and everyone is nice and if there's something wrong with him, it's because it's something in his genes or, or because his mother... You know, she shouted at him in his childhood and you can't really blame him for, for killing 20 people with an axe and, you know, it's just something in his genes or something like this. But, but Shastra is not, it is very clear what is right and what is wrong. And what is right is what is acting for the pleasure of Krishna. What is wrong is not acting for the pleasure of Krishna. So, this is all very clearly defined differentiating karma and jnana and demigod worship and mayavad and all these different things from shuddha bhakti so our acharyas come to teach shuddha bhakti which means full surrender to Krishna for his pleasure this is the only uh, activity auspicious activity for the jiva there is no other auspicious activity mixed devotion but the mishra bhakti mixed devotion or mitha bhakti Bhakti for show, this is not at all auspicious for the jiva. The only auspicious path is uh, full surrender to Krishna, acting only for his pleasure. So that is the fact which is to be taught to persons coming to Krishna conscious. They may come because they may come in the beginning for so many different reasons. Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita that people come basically Chatur Vidhabajanti Manjana Sukriti and Arjuna. Artho Jignasu Artati Gyani Chabharatashava. Four kinds of pious people come to Bhakti. People who are pious. It means they they want some money, they uh, they want some relief from material distress they're inquisitive or they're actually seeking the absolute truth. Mostly people come not not at a very high level. Mostly people come out of curiosity or because they have some family problem or for these different reasons people come. Translation is required? Hindi translation? It's going on? No, for ladies or some some only Hindi understanding, Hindi and maybe Sindhi participants just came. So, mostly people come for material reasons, but they have that much piety and good fortune that they come to Krishna. The, the other side of Chatur Vidha Bhajante Man, what's, what's the other side? Well, we could say Namang Dushkritinos, that's one side. But another is Vita Raga Bayakrota Manmaya Mamupashitaha 
Bahava Ujana Tapusa, Puta Mad Bhava Magataha that persons who are free from attachment, fear and anger, who uh Peter, whose, whose mind is attached to me after many uh, lives of austerity of beta falling out, after many lifetimes of cultivating knowledge and detachment, they become attached to me, Krishna says. So, but the, the other side is beta raga bhai, that if out of attachment, fear and anger, people go away from Krishna. Just like if someone has some material problems, if they're pious, they go to Krishna. If they're impious, they reject. There's no God. Who is this? This uh, that, that came in the week magazine a couple of years ago. Is there God? The question came up. And they, one of the, they questioned different people. Well, do you believe there's God or not? As if God is subject to some opinion of <laughs> rascals. So one of the people they asked was Ram Jet Malani. Did I get it right? I, I, I'm never sure whether it's Jet Malani or Jet Lamani. He's not a money, he's a Lani. Is it? Jet Malani. Ram Jet, Jet Malani. Okay. So he said, Well, I used to believe in God, but when I went to Gujarat, I saw the earth. I went there and saw the earthquake victims and people buried underneath rubble for so many hours and calling out and crying and then dying in pain then I started to have doubts. So people think that God's function is to make this world nice for us to live in. If there's suffering in the world that, that means there can't be any... There's a commonly asked question especially in, uh, among Christians not so much among Hindus because they have some idea of the law of karma but it's a commonly asked question if there is God, why is there so much suffering? Because they think that God's function is to to uh, wipe our backside after we pass stool. That's what God... He should make everything comfortable for us. They think that's His job. And if there's any suffering, that uh, that means there's no God. Because God's function is to make us happy. They don't understand that our function is to make God happy. He's happy, but he'd be more happy if we would stop trying to make ourselves happy independently of him. So, uh, yeah, Vita Raga, people who are attached to this material world, uh, they may come to Krishna, or out of anger, they may reject the idea of God altogether. That, oh, you say, I believed in God and then all my children died. There's a, I, when you see this book on Bhakti Siddhanta, so you'll see this. There's one person, his, I'll just tell briefly that uh, there was one man who, he had his guru, Vaishnav guru, he wasn't that interested, but then his daughter became very sick. His beloved daughter became very sick. So he became, he really increased his bhakti and he was always chanting, Gore, Gore, Gore! And going to his guru every day and making special offerings to the deity. And he became very devoted when his daughter, his beloved, his only beloved daughter became very sick. Uh, so his friend was astonished to see this. He became so de- became so full of bhakti. This friend reported this to Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati. That my, my friend, he became so much full of bhakti. Then after, I didn't see him for some time. And then uh, after some time I saw him. And he wasn't chanting Gaur, Gaur anymore. And I said, well, what happened? You were chanting Gaur, Gaur. And he said, Gaur? There's no such person as Gaur. If there had been any such person as Gaur, then I became so much devoted to him. Why didn't he save my daughter who died in great pain? Even though I was so devoted to him. So this friend, the, the friend of this person said, that, why is that? He was chanting Gaur, Gaur and had so much bhakti and still his daughter died in pain. Bhakti Sansar Thakur said, he never worshipped Gaur. He was worshipping Shaitan in the name of Gaur. <laughs> he was thinking that, this is a commonly used phrase that they, he, he was taking, Bhakti Sansar used to say that, that they're taking God or Gora as the supplier of fuel for my fire of sense gratification. He should, Bhagavan should come and carry 
the fuel that is required to put in my huge fire of desire for sense gratification. That is his job. So, he rejected, he never worshipped God. He, had no, he never had any bhakti whatsoever. What he considered bhakti was his attempt to engage Bhagawan in his service, which is not at all bhakti. So, shuddha bhakti, our acharyas come to teach shuddha bhakti, which is why they are very much different from the Mitya bhaktas or those who make a big show of bhakti and sing very nicely because they want to impress people and people want to be cheated our acharyas they speak tattva jnana and they don't show bhav it may be that just like for instance you see we can understand that Prabhupada is definitely a very very strong feelings for Krishna, isn't it? Genuine feelings for Krishna, otherwise how could he sacrifice him? Take so, so many troubles for preaching Krishna consciousness all over the world. But Prabhupada never showed his feelings. Sometimes that becomes spontaneously manifest. He didn't control. One time in Mayapur, Prabhupada was giving a lecture and he became stunned in ecstasy. And the devotees, they didn't know what to do and they just Prabhupada suddenly stopped he was, just, he was giving a class speaking philosophy as usual you can hear that lecture it's there in it. and uh, Prabhupada was talking he was saying surrender means that we have to give everything to Krishna he was explaining what is surrender he said just like the gopis they never wanted anything from Krishna and then you can hear the tape it's in silence Prabhupada was talking about the principle of surrender and then suddenly he talked about the gopis and their surrender. And Prabhupada became completely stunned in his silence for about a minute and then you can hear Hansa Dutta's you can hear his typical voice Uskoni me bachakya Anubhadha Ho hai Uta So Prabhupada he became completely stunned Hansa Dutta you can hear his typical voice his unique voice he started singing started singing Hare Krishna and all the devotees joined in and that was the end of the class so later on in the day one of the devotees Brahmananda I believe was said to Prabhupada Prabhupada today in class you became stunned and Prabhupada said what he, he shyly said well I don't do that very often as if he was apologizing that that Ecstasy obviously is always going on in Prabhupada's heart, but he never showed it. Because he has to he has to teach his followers what is surrendered to Krishna by his practical example, but not show no show. Whereas the generally what people think is a bhakti is someone who's always showing all the time during the lecture. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> big show but they don't teach Tattva Gyan which is required for the sadhak to differentiate between what is spirit and what is matter what is bhakti and what is abhakti that is required so those who want to be cheated they like to hear from persons who they're cheating because no genuine acharya makes a big show he speaks for the for the benefit of others so those that like to be cheated they, they go and they say this is real bhakti but they're by hearing they actually move further away from real bhakti they're the, you, if you find some drunkard on the street it's more easy to, give, to impress on them what is bhakti than these people who think who, that already, I'm already there. I'm already with the gopis. They, they presume falsely that they're already there. So, uh, this verse is there, Sanatana Goswami. Avaishnava mokhod girnam putam harikatamritam shravana naiva kartavya sarpo chishtam yutapaya. It's one of the verses I, I learned very well when I was in Bangladesh because there we, we were mostly 
our mission is among the Hindus already have bhakti. But it's all fish eating bhakti and biri smoking bhakti and filling up the belly of the false guru bhakti and all this kind of bhakti. So this verse means that one should not hear Hari Kata from non Vaishnavas. It's like taking milk which is already touched by the lips of a poisonous snake. Milk is very nourishing. Milk is very palatable. Milk is called Amrit. Krishna Kata is also called Amrit. But if we take milk which is touched by the lips of a snake, it may taste the same, and look the same, but it poisons us and kills us. So in the same way, if we hear from non-devotees about Krishna, then the result will be, not, not that we advance in Krishna consciousness, but that we, our Krishna consciousness is spoiled. Again, Shuti, Smriti, Purana, Adi, Pancharatra, Vidhindina, Aikantiki, Hare Bhakti, Utpata, Yariva Kalpate. Bhakti, which is preached in human society, which is not exactly following the Shastric conclusion, it is not beneficial to human society, it's a disturbance. So then we say, well, who's, uh, we have to understand who is Vaishnav, who is not Vaishnav. One who is posing as a Vaishnav, like Putana, is not a Vaishnav. Is Putana a Vaishnav? We may say, if we see superficially, we say yes. But then when we see what is our actual intent, we'll understand no, not at all. So, therefore, the Acharyas, they give us the not, we, we say, Agyana timirandhasya, agyananjana shalakaya, chakshurun militam jena tasmai shri guravenama. The Guru is praised specifically for giving us the knowledge by which we can distinguish reality from illusion. The Srimad Bhagavatam starts on the same note. Knowledge Vedyam Vasavam Atravastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Nulanam It is that is the actual knowledge of the Vedas by which uh, reality is distinguished from illusion for the benefit of all. So that is what is required. Now, it's difficult for people to understand this immediately. Therefore, we don't generally, some people may do, but not all preachers and not in all times, places and circumstances do we approach people, you meet them on the street and they say, we start to talk to them, or we meet them so they start to talk to them and then we say, well, actually, I'm, a, I'm into this ISKCON, Hare Krishna movement. And, uh, and then they say, oh, what's that all about? And then we tell them that, okay. <laughs> now you have to immediately give up all your bad habits, such as, I don't have any bad habits. Drink tea, you're a demon. <laughs> That guru, he's a demon. You're a demon. Give it up immediately. So, generally it's not found to be a very effective means of pre preaching to expect people to change on the spot immediately. Um, we may speak what is the actual truth and it, it may, that's good, we should do that's what we're not supposed to speak falsities, we're supposed to speak the truth. But at the same time, we can't expect that everyone's going to immediately take it up. It may be also that in many cases we just invite people to come and just experience that Krishna consciousness is very nice, because Krishna consciousness is very nice. There, our appreciation in the beginning of its niceness may be limited to, well, that's nice singing, nice food nice people so that may be to bring people in we present it as something this is not very nice very good for your family very moral this is good for the children and they won't be such rascals as we could otherwise expect them to be if you don't give them any religious training it's often people say well religion is very good because it makes people moral but <laughs> it's a back to front understanding Krishna consciousness means morality. Not that 
Christian consciousness or religion is a servant of morality. But people have these various misconceptions. So in the beginning we may not try to blast out all their misconceptions. But at the same time we shouldn't. Cell phones off please. Sorry for not being nice. But if you do it again, we'll take your cell phone and throw it out of the window. And you too. Okay, throw him out of the window. Oh, wait a minute, it was supposed to be nice. Sorry, I forgot. All right. We also shouldn't act against the law. So I think it's out of the law to throw people from the sixth law. So we should follow the laws of the state also. Um, so actually Krishna consciousness if we consider what it is compared to what if what is Shuddha Bhakti compared to what most people in this world are doing it's actually quite exclusivist and would be considered by most people fanaticism or fundamentalism. If we tell people, or if, if we live as we're supposed to live as devotees, then we're going to tend to get cut off from others because like, we're not supposed to eat karmi food, food cooked by non-devotees, we're not supposed to drink tea, coffee, wine, we're not supposed to go to movies, we're not supposed to watch cricket on TV, um, even dressing attractively fashions, we may dress decently, but it's not that devotees are so foolish as to follow all the latest fashions. Now we have to have high heeled shoes because it's all the fashion. It's actually very bad for your posture and your spine and all this. By the way, if you want if you if you don't like what I just said is if we don't follow fashions, then we can bring you down to the platform of the body. It's not good for your body either. And the body is very important, isn't it? So High heeled shoes are not good for health. Usually when we we often say to people that, well, don't eat meat, it's not good for health, and then oh, oh okay, I better my body is very important, so I shouldn't eat meat. Well, it's, it's very bad also because it, more important it stops our bhakti. But if we say that, they'll say, well, I can be, I can have, I'm, I have lots of bhakti, so I can still eat meat. That's Vivekananda's <laughs> Vivekananda's idea. It doesn't matter what you eat; it's it's your consciousness. So we have to tell people that actually it's very bad for your health and you get heart attack and this and so, oh really, I better stop eating meat. And that's not really the reason for stopping to eat meat. So, uh, <clears throat> preaching then, how do, uh, uh, no, first this point, exclu Krishna consciousness is exclusive and if we're actually to follow Krishna consciousness then it's not just my opinion that we shouldn't watch cricket on TV or Hardly anything else on TV, because why should we why should we subject ourselves to the opinions of non devotees? It's is nothing Krishna conscious. There might be some occasionally something. I mean, I'm on TV too, so I'm supposed to be Krishna conscious. So if you like, you can watch that. But uh, mostly, even this Discovery Channel. I mean, what is it? Is it really important that we have to learn from Discovery Channel about the mating habits of? some frogs in Argentina or something. <laughs> it's, it, it's, what's the use? It's just a waste of time. You may say, well, it's knowledge, but it's useless knowledge. Knowledge means to distinguish spirit from matter, and that you won't get. Subtly you'll get from Discovery Channel, you'll, subtly you'll get that this material world is a very nice place, and we should all live in it very happily, along with the frogs. <laughs> or maybe we'll eat them also whatever makes us happy. So, uh, these are basic principles of Krishna consciousness. It's actually quite exclusive. If we're actually to practice Krishna, if we actually understand what Krishna consciousness is, then it's quite exclusive. Even to the level demigod worship, should we worship demigods? And then the question comes, well, we've been doing this for so many generations in our family, and should we follow these different rituals? If we don't follow, then our parents will be very upset and they'll reject us and all these questions come up. Should we do or shouldn't we do? When we go home to our parents and they want, they want to 
serve us this uh, biryani. You say, well, I don't eat that anymore. But it's your favorite dish. And I always cooked it for you. I always enjoyed to cook it for you. And now you don't want to eat it. What's wrong with you? You don't love me anymore. And all this kind of thing. So, how to deal with all of this? Should we be very exclusivist? Or maybe it's not so bad that we worship some demigod. That's another big question. Maybe I should deal with that in another, another class altogether. The whole question of demigod worship. So, uh, how to deal with all of this? Well, we'll have to see in each individual case. First of all, how much is our conviction? And what is the position of others? How to deal with our parents and others who, or children who are not interested in be, or not very interested in being Krishna conscious? We can't give very clear or exact guidelines because each person is different and each case is different. But at least in principle we have to understand that Krishna consciousness, if we are actually to be Krishna conscious, then we have to surrender to Krishna sooner or later and sooner better. Why later? And at some point in time we are going to have to do that even if it means that others who are otherwise near and dear to us may not be very satisfied. Or it may mean going in our workplace we may be ridiculed that there's an office party should we go or shouldn't we? Well, the office party means booze and talking nonsense. Should we go or shouldn't we? You shouldn't. But then it may affect our career prospects and people won't be happy with us. So we may have to choose that people being happy with us and Krishna being happy with us. What do you choose? The devotee will always choose that Krishna will be happy with us. Now if you go to the office party and turn it around so that everyone starts chanting Hare Krishna, very good. But if we don't have the Shakti to do so, then we should avoid it. Or So, it, becoming Krishna conscious means in most cases that we may have to we, we may become unpopular with, uh, with others or we, it may affect our family relationships. So the bottom line is that we cannot sacrifice Krishna consciousness for the mundane pleasure of others. Now if we're very strong and if we're very expert we may play the game of compromising somewhat with others for some time and gradually bring others in. That's also possible. That we can, maybe we go to our parents and then don't eat chicken biryani. That's not possible if one's trying to become a devotee. But we, we shouldn't eat food cooked by non-devotees but we may, we may say that well, mum... I love you very much, so cook something vegetarian and we'll offer it to Krishna without onions and garlic. Actually, we shouldn't if we're to be very strict. But we might, if we do that, then it might, it might be too much for them and to take. But if we take it step by step, we might compromise on some principle of not eating food cooked by non-devotees. We, we might choose to compromise that principle just to maintain a relationship and then gradually try to bring them in. So some compromises may be made in preaching. But how far to go? Uh, that we have to consider because if a compromise becomes a habit or if in the name of an adjustment we accept as that it's acceptable to practice on a lower level then our bhakti is stopped. For instance, if we think, well, I eat in my mother's house and she's a meat eater, so I'm feeling hungry and there's no prasad around, so I'll go in McDonald's and I'll take some vegetarian French fries. So that's a compromise of the principle. There's no need to do that. If you're hungry, 
and there's no prasad, well, one thing you can do is just fast rather than go in McDonald's. Or you can go to uh, Safeway or something. They have Safeway here? Some store. Toy drum over the road. You can go to some supermarket and buy some fruit. And you may say, well, that's not a full meal. But still, we cannot sacrifice our principle to eat in a meat restaurant. The idea is that when, if we start to make adjustments, we have to be very careful that we don't take that as an excuse in our rascal mind to make more and more adjustments and say that, well, everything's okay and everything's all... We can do anything. and I'm doing it for... I'm eating the French fries in McDonald's because I have to keep my body strong so I can do bhakti. We can, it's always possible to justify things in our rascal minds. But that becomes an obstacle to bhakti because that's not pleasing to Krishna. And we get the, the consciousness and the karma of the cooks now that might seem like a very extreme example but I've seen and am seeing in our ISKCON how devotees when we're not, who are not very strict and strong on the principle of surrendering to Krishna and preaching Krishna consciousness if we don't at least preach it on the highest level and try to practice it on the high level then we start to think that a lower level is acceptable in other words we give a foot to Maya and then Maya gradually comes in in various ways as well this is okay and that's okay and it's okay to play sports because it's good for health and exercise is important we have to be healthy and, and then we find there's a devotee golf competition <laughs> not soccer they're more high class in California there's a devotee's golf competition so which is nonsense uh, one thing is it's expensive to play golf you don't spend money and waste your time if you have a heart attack on the golf course you're going to be remembering Krishna and you're going to be thinking about some little ball and how to put it in a hole it's, it's against the principle of bhakti abhyarta kaladvam that time should not be spent for anything but Krishna consciousness so the, once we start to compromise then compromise comes more and more and more so, yes, there may be some adjustments, but we shouldn't take the adjustment as, as the higher principle or the highest principle. And if, if after ten years, our mother still wants to cook us chicken biryani and there's, she still hasn't made any progress, then uh, why should we go, and go on and on and on maintaining... Of course, you don't outright reject, but... They, they should make some progress otherwise what's the what's the point with my own father I must admit that uh, he's not made any progress beyond saying Hare Krishna he's not bad for a beef eater um, I don't see much sign of much progress but on the other hand I haven't put much time into him one phone call a year so you know I, I, there are so many other people who are give, give, giving a little time they can come up in Krishna consciousness better so I must maintain some kind of not really friendship but not, not enmity my relationship with my father as much as it is is rather mundane but uh, I, I, why, why should I put so much effort into trying to make him a devotee when the, there's not he has not shown any sign of showing any interest in it, and there are many others who have much more interest in it. So, uh, but people in general are attached to their families, and in one sense that's good because we 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 want that the family should be strong so that children especially get women and children are to be protected within the family unit it's required in human society if it's not to become non-human that women and children be protected that's to be done within the family so it's strong families are required and within the family the culture of Krishna consciousness is mostly to be preached because most people are not going to be sannyasis so it is important that there is 
strong families. But at the same time, we have to understand that our real family is the family of devotees. So, it's natural that we feel attachment to our family members, even if they're not devotees. But at the same time, we have to understand that our real our attachment is to Krishna. And that it may be that our family members are pushing us not to be devotees. So we should understand that if, the, if they're pushing like that and we can't change that, that that's actually, it's asat sangha, it's, it's not good for our Krishna consciousness. So although we may not go to the extent of openly and outrightly rejecting them and, 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 and unnecessarily trying to make them feel unhappy, it may be that uh, we'll have to go on practicing Krishna consciousness and which may it may make the family members feel unhappy, but we can't compromise our Krishna consciousness to suit them. On the on the other hand, we don't have to go out of our way to to tell them that I don't that we we don't agree with what you're doing and you're all in Maya and all this and that. We can handle it somewhat diplomatically, but even things like they may there there are many instances just like. Someone is to be married, and they're to be married within their caste rules, and in their caste they worship this demigod. So should we do that or not? The question will come. It, it, in many cases, it will it will depend on the strength of the devotee, his own conviction. If he's more convinced, then he won't do that. He won't go to a demigod, even if it's the caste rule for Benedict. I, when we get married, we go to this demigod temple, but a devotee won't go. Even the whole family is against. Because Anya Deva Shrai Nai Tomare Kahinubai E Bhakti Paramakara. We don't take shelter of any other demigod. Or anyway I have to discuss this in demigod worship or or uh, he he may go say but then pray to the demigod that yes, please bless me with Krishna Bhakti. But he'll but the, the, the rituals that are done, they are karma kandya. They are actually apathetic, antipathetic, opposed to bhakti. So generally a devotee won't want to go along with these things. Then there's the whole question of shrad, which is done, non-Vaishnavas do according to smarter rites, which are, again, antipathetic to bhakti. So that's often a big question. There's another thing bhakti Sansasra Thakur is very strong about. He's not to do the smarta shrad. He must do it according to the system. Because in Bengal they do the, the prait shrad. That means that the, the, the idea that if you don't, well, let's say that the, if you, if you don't do shrad, then your forefathers or the deceased person will become a ghost. But if the forefather is a Vaishnav, it's extremely offensive to think that they'll become a ghost. And they do shrad by offering flesh. So, it was very difficult for people to, he used to say, it was really a test of whether they're a real disciple or not, if they're willing to do the Vaishnav Shrad, right, the, right, according to the Vaishnav system rather than the Smarta system. It was a very big test for his disciples. And actually one of his leading disciples, after many years in the mission, he, uh, when his mother died, he did the Smarta Shrad, even despite hearing so, and even despite Bhaktisthan Saraswati Thakur telling him specifically, don't do this, you must do it again. He, he, he did according to the same. So, um, so that there come so many questions about how to interact with others. Um, then again, who should we hear from? Should we hear from Vaishnavas who are they're not really teaching the proper philosophy. It's more like a show. Should we hear from them? No. <laughs> uh, we should distinguish between who's an actual devotee and who isn't. Um, we'll find in any sampradaya, or any, even if they're not bona fide, they'll always stress that you you stay within this group and hear, hear, hear. H e a r h e r e, here, here. Don't go elsewhere to here, because 
the tendency will to become will be there to become confused. Even Prabhupada said about his god brothers that if you hear if one of them says something different from me, that will create confusion. And that's actually going on in this God today because we have various gurus who are all following Prabhupada, we hope. Um giving different perspectives on different things. So I'm it may sometimes it's said that well that's your guru and this is my guru and he says something different. But we should understand from the perspective of not that one guru is different opinion, but what is what is the Siddhanta according to Tattva Gyan? Is it that that well, my no, no guru will say. But if you said, well, someone has said you shouldn't play cricket, but my guru didn't say. That. If he didn't say, it doesn't mean that he approves it. If you, if he, if someone asked the question to your guru, is it all right to play cricket? Run out of the room quickly so you don't hear what he said. <laughs> this is then. That's not bhakti. Then that's not discipleship either. We should be anxious to understand what is the absolute truth. Who is Krishna? How to attain Krishna? That's another misconception that, well, you know, you you have a guru, you stick the picture on the wall, you offer some incense, and that's a, that's that's what being a disciple means. But, but we have to hear and base our lives on what we hear, and we should be prepared to hear and implement in our lives that which may not be very pleasing to us on the bodily platform. So we should hear from Guru and even we there may be other Vaishnavas but if we hear from them we may become confused because different Sampradayas teach different things. Now we have here among us our dear Ranganath Prabhu who is had the great fortune of being born in a family which for many generations has worshipped the Lord in the Sampradaya of Sripad Ramanujacharya and sitting next to him is Bhim Madha Prabhu who is from a similar Madhva background and there may be others also who have now come to appreciate the gifts of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and naturally they feel very attached to the sampradayas in which they were brought up in Krishna consciousness and I encourage that in both their cases but I wouldn't generally encourage others to go to those who have come to Krishna consciousness from a background which is closer to mine which is meat eating and, or even smarta which which is quite opposed to shuddha bhakti because, because otherwise the tendency may be to become confused there is harmony but we may see confusion there are some members of the madhva sampradaya some some who are software engineers in America who have taken a very fanatical stance against Iskon and Prabhupada and they're very offensive actually and they don't represent what the Madhva sannyasis who or Madhva followers who I often meet in Udupi I'm, I'm sure I go there more than these people because they're in America they're, they went there they, they, they could have become Madhva pundits, but they chose to become software engineers instead. So, one can become confused. Um, even even if one hears good, genuine speakers, one can become confused. Because although there is harmony between the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and that of Ramanuja, Madhvacharya, Balabhacharya, there are differences also which if we're not very deep in understanding we may become confused just like in 
uh, Sri Vaishnav Sampradaya, Ramanuja Sampradaya, they're very strong on the point that the original form of God is Vishnu and Krishna are not different, but the original form is Vishnu. Whereas in Gorya Sampradaya, we uphold on the basis of the Acharyas and Shastras that Vishnu and Krishna are non different, but the original form is Krishna. So if we if we if we're not mature in living with that difference, we may become confused. And also because Krishna, Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Anarpita Chirin Chirat Karunya Avatir no Kolo Samapita Munatanjvala Rasa Sapakti Sriyam. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is offering that which was not given previously, which is the culmination of all the Acharya's teachings, love beyond surrender. The, the Charam Shlok in the of the Ramanuja Sampradaya, or the topmost teaching, is Sarvadhaman Parateta Mame Kam Sharnam Raja. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches beginning from them. Prema Pumato Mahan. Now the, the, the seeds or, or, or everything we'll find in this you'll find also in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya Andal who's the expressing love for the Lord in which parallels that of the Gopikas of Vrindavan. But still if we're to see on the, the higher level of teaching how Chaitanya we're not on that higher level, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants to bring us to that level. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching is that of uh, Madhurya Rasa, Vipralamba Madhurya Rasa. So ultimately Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has got something more. Rasgulas with vitamins. <laughs> Not just Rasgulas, but with vitamins also. So... Uh, In, in the higher levels of Gorya Vaishnav teaching, the desire to go to Vaikuntha is considered an obstacle. Isn't that amazing? Raghunath Das Goswami talks of being thrown down to Vaikuntha. That's a very high level. But that is the level that we're aspiring for. So, if one has the background of... We also want to promote that. If one has the background of Ramanujya Vaishnav Madhva background we also want to promote that we don't say this should be rigid we want to promote that what what are the gifts of, of our acharyas and one of our devotees has uh, brought out a book the, the life of Ramanujya Sripad Ramanujya Acharya and there's an unpublished very extensive book it's unpublished probably because it's so extensive on the the life and legacy of Srimad Bhagavad Pad Madhvacharya. So, very great detail, tremendous detail he's written. I have it in my computer. But it's not published, it probably won't be published because it needs a lot of editing to be published in book form. So, we, we want to promote this. We want to promote the teachings, along with the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But for most of us, we hardly have time to even read Prabhupada's books, isn't it? So for most of us, it's better that we stick to what Prabhupada has given us. If we do have that good fortune of the good background of, of uh, being brought up in a Vaishnava Sampradaya, that we, we should go on with that. It's not something to be rejected. We have to add the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to, to that. But for others, unless we're specialists in philosophy, or, then it, it might not be necessary and may be a diversion also to try to understand about so many different sampradayas when we don't even understand what this sampradaya is giving us. So I spoke very generally because it is a very big, broad topic. Uh, but these are just some general thoughts. Um, there was an issue here recently also about devotees going to hear one speaker came from Vrindavan. 
should we go to hear him or not? I would say, not only I would say, but based on what I've understood from Prabhupada, that uh, no, we shouldn't, because fr- from what we can understand, according to the symptoms of Shuddha Bhakti, he's not a Shuddha Bhakta. He may officially come in a bona fide sampradaya, but we don't see that people come into that sampradaya. People do come to that sampradaya, mostly because of the teachings of Prabhupada. And because of Prabhupada's teachings, many people are coming not directly to Prabhupada, but to other different sampradayas also. But we don't see that people come to that sampradaya, they don't develop even to give up drinking tea. So. How is one going to become advanced? If you don't, even some very basic things, one cannot give them up. So there's more, there's some controversy over that, which uh, I don't know if we have time to get into all that, or if we even want to here, but maybe you you could address that, have some meeting and address that, and consider. There are other considerations, or there are other, there may be other considerations also, just like. We're preaching among certain people, and we're we're taking, just like we're we we're taking favors from others, just like that. Like the Krishna temple here, we're taking help from them, and they're giving us facility. So how far should we go in reciprocating with certain things that we ourselves may not wish to do? So all these questions come up. That's why Bhaktisthan Sarasar Thakur, when he was asked once, that why are you building temples when there are already so many temples? He said, we need a place where we can speak our own message, unadulterated, without consideration of what others think or have to say about anything. So there may be other factors also. So having said that, I'm going to finish here for now. Um... And you can all chant Hare Krishna for five minutes. Because the body is very important if it's engaged in Krishna's service. And I'm trying to engage my body in Krishna's service. And I have to do something necessary for the body, which will take five minutes. So please chant Hare Krishna. Uh, one important point that I should have made, I'll make now, is that in all these matters, how in dealing with parents, workplace situations, uh, how to deal with non-devotees in preaching, following our principles. In all these matters, in, in the beginning stages of our Krishna conscious life, it's very important that we be, be guided by devotees who are uh, clear about the principles of Krishna consciousness. Uh, and at the same time are experienced in interacting with the people of this world. Hmm. So there are a few questions written here. How do we discriminate between a real guru and a fake guru? There's no such thing as a fake guru. If he's a fake, he's not a guru. (laughs) But we say like that because there are fakes posing as gurus. Just like we say Sadguru. Guru means Sadguru. If he's our Sad, then he's not Guru. But we say Sadguru to to under, underline the point that he's actually a Guru. Most of the people who are called Sadgurus are not Sadgurus actually. They're all fakes. Well, it's a commonly, it's an important question. Um, there's a book being published recently written by one of my disciples actually because this is a common point that comes up it's written in Hindi it's available here Guru Konhe there's only one thing wrong with that book and that my pictures in it I told him to take it out in the second edition so the point is that we're talking about principles it's not that he said I didn't put it to promote you but just I thought I should put because you're my guru and you want to show the principle of gratefulness to Guru. But I, I said that it would, it would be misunderstood. So, 
he left it out in the next edition. The first edition only is here. So that's dealt with in some detail in that book. If Maha Mantra is so potent, then why should one chant Gayatri? Maha Mantra is complete. Sarva Siddhi Hoy, everything comes from chanting Hare Krishna. Gayatri, but the mantra may be chanted. It's also it's specifically given to devotees who, to, who are to engage in deity worship because there are some specific mantras to be chanted which are um, specifically for deity worship. And also, although the Maha Mantra is the best of all mantras, it's not the only mantra. Other mantras may be chanted also. Would we get would we get a sin to us? Oh, I'll just I'll restate this and is it sinful to preach to somebody and he starts blaspheming Krishna? Um, well it is it's considered offensive to preach in such a way that to preach to faithless people in such a way that they become more offensive. So it requires some uh, actually very neophyte person shouldn't preach. First one should hear and understand. Preaching, a very yes, very newcomers can ask everyone, please chant Hare Krishna. But they shouldn't try to explain that which they don't understand or which they don't know how to present. That, to what extent should we go in preaching Krishna conscious? How far should we go? We should go to the extent that they fully surrender to Krishna. Or as far as they can go, which might be as far as asking. Best preaching is, Prabhupada always said, to distribute his books. So, often people want to accept the philosophy, but if we, if we can't expect that we'll just change people. We are ourselves trying to learn this philosophy. So, we can't expect that everyone will accept it immediately. But we can ask them to take a book. Generally, for preaching, that's the recommended that we, that we give people books and then if, if they in, on the basis of that if they start to inquire submissively then preaching can uh, go very nicely I cannot concentrate what is the drawback the drawback is that our minds are not attached to Krishna my mind is bewildered what is the solution Read Bhagavad Gita as it is every day and associate with pure devotees. That is the solution. What is the difference between Madhva philosophy and Chaitanya Mahabharata's teachings? Well, the sameness is more. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We are His eternal servants. We can never become one with God. There are differences. Actually, Madhva himself, one of the main points he stresses is difference. <laughs> because the Mayavadis, they stress non-difference. So, the, the, one of the main differences there is that he worships Bal Gopal or Krishna alone, whereas Chaitanya Mahaprabhu worships with Radha. That's one of the main differences. But uh, Madhva philosophy it's presented very elaborately. So better we first understand what are Chait what is Ch let us understand what is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings from Prabhupada's books. Because we actually the Madhva philosophy is so complex that unless for most people, unless we read Prabhupada's books, we can't even begin to understand it anyway. What do you think about that? <laughs> you, without understanding Prabhupada's books then we can't even begin to understand what are all these philosophies because they're, they're presented, they were presented to a different class of people than the modern people who are brought up on Pepsi, Cola and Tom and Jerry <laughs> previously in India people had culture and, and Shastra and learning and understanding 
So the philosophy was also presented in a in a manner suitable for such cultured and educated people. We can't even understand the concepts. Prabhupada has made it very simple for us. Why is the eighth month of pregnancy said to be crucial? I didn't even know it was crucial. I, please see a gynecologist. <laughs> oh, is it, re- is it related to some incident as per the Shastra? No, actually in Shastra I believe it says in the seventh month of pre- pregnancy that the consciousness of the child is awakened. So especially from that time uh, it's a, that we should or the mother especially should chant a lot loudly so the child in the womb can hear. Shouldn't we develop tolerance for other sampradayas if they lead people to the same path of Krishna? Not only tolerance, we should develop the highest regard for sampradayas that lead people to the path of Krishna. But we should develop great intolerance for those that do not lead people to Krishna and even more intolerance for those that that say that they lead people to Krishna but don't. If we experience deep emotion during kirtan, should we downplay our bhakti or take it as a first step towards developing Krishna Prem. Um, well that deep emotion see here it's presumed that if we experience deep emotion during kirtan that that is bhakti but actually is it bhakti we'll have to see after the kirtan <laughs> Because if after experiencing deep emotion during kirtan, we still feel attracted to things which have no relation to bhakti, then we can understand that that deep emotion may be some gift of Krishna to give us some little idea of what actual bhakti means, but that if we still have attachment to anything material, that it cannot be considered to be mature or full bhakti. So bhakti is not something that we turn off and we it's turned off and turned on. Now I'm just like uh, one of our devotees wrote a he was right he wrote a book as he was reading the the revelations or the realizations of Saint Therese of Avignon or someone like that who is, and she was ex- expressing deep emotional feelings for God and he was writing the book and saying well this is very nice and, this, and then it came to the end of the, towards the end of the book it said that she, she was eating deer's meat deer you know what that is harin is that what it's called in Hindi hiran yeah. hiran in Bengal and someone was shocked to see that and said, well, why are you eating? You're, you're a great saint. Why are you eating deer's meat? She said, you, you have so many ecstasies. She said, there's a time for ecstasy and there's a time for eating deer's meat. <laughs> so then the author, he still went ahead and published the book, Satsuru Maharaj, and said, well, maybe her ecstasies weren't so deep after all. So, if we experience ecstasy, it that is analyzed by Rupa Goswami that may be shadow ecstasy it may be just a shadow not actually the real thing or it may be a gift from Krishna to give us some impetus to go forward in bhakti but if if we actually have love of Krishna we wouldn't be asking this question we wouldn't have this confusion we, if we actually had love of Krishna we would think I have no bhakti Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expressed I have no bhakti so then people asked well then why are you crying in Kirtan he says just to show I don't have any actual bhakti because if I had any actual bhakti I couldn't stay alive the feelings would rip my body to pieces could you please explain the concept of Satya Narayan Kata the concept is we worship Satya Narayan and get something mitya for our sense enjoyment. This is conducted for sense gratification. It has nothing to do with devotional service to Krishna. 
It's not Narayan Bhakti. Bhakti means Rishi Kena Rishi Kesha Sevanang Bhakti Ruchate. We employ our senses for the pleasure of Narayana. Not that we worship him. I, I'm, I'm giving you some sense gratification, now you give me some. That's how we deal with in the material world. We go to some, uh, we, we see the boss and we're very nice with him. Oh, you're a great boss, because we're expecting some pay rise from him. So the same way we go to Narayan, you're wonderful, you're great, here, give me this, give me that. It's a materialistic dealing. It has nothing to do with bhakti. Demigod worship is the same. Can we eat fruits in a non-veg restaurant? <laughs> Why do you want to do that? <laughs> it may be someone has to take someone out for a business lunch or something like that. Better bring your own fruit. Don't cut it with their meat knife. They're cutting the meat and then they cut the fruit with this. Ask for whole fruit. Unpeeled bananas. Bring your own knife. <laughs> if you have to. It's not really funny. It's so miserable that people who want to serve Krishna have to go dance to the tune of these horrible people. But what can you do? Since Krishna's name is the most powerful and pure, then how can the kata, kirtan of Krishna, become poisonous when heard from a non-devotee? That's a very good question. Krishna nam, nama chintamani krishnas chaitanya rasa vigraha purno shuddho nitya mukta abhinatvam nama namina. The name of Krishna is not, is Krishna. The name of Krishna is full, complete, fully spiritual. So how can the name of Krishna become poisonous when uttered by a non-devotee? The answer is Asadu Shange Bhai Krishna Nam Nahi Hoy Nama Kor Bahire Bote Tabu Nam Nahi Hoy That the name spoken by a non-devotee is not the name. It, the syllables Ha Ri Krishna may be there but Krishna is not there. Because Krishna manifests himself where there is love. Krishna it cannot be cheated but by the cheating of someone who is pretending to be a devotee. So just like someone may bring a deity and it's very common whenever there is some big temple there are many small temples come up all around because they think that the pilgrims will come to this temple also and and give some money and we'll live very easily. Or in Hyderabad, one Marwari, this is about 20 years ago, his business wasn't doing very well. So he built a Hanuman temple, built a sweet shop outside. He became the head pujari accepting all the offerings. And uh, his son became in charge of the sweet shop. And he spread the rumor in the area that if you offer these ladus to this Hanuman, you get all blessings. <laughs> So it became a good business. So, but Krishna is not such a fool that he can be cheated by the cheating of someone who pretends to be his devotee for the sake of cheating others. Just like Ravana must have been saying the name of Ram also. So Ram is present wherever his name is chanted. Of course, Ram is all pervade. Ram comes when people are chanting his name with bhakti. So Ram also came to Ravana to kill him. Mm. A Jamil's chanting is a different case. A Jamil in his youth chanted the name of Narayan with bhakti. But his bhakti became covered by Pap. He didn't chant the name of Narayan to cheat others, to pretend to be a great devotee. He called out in great fear, remembering his son, but at that time, the, the real the, the remembrance of his actual bhakti for Narayan came in his mind and therefore Narayan protected him but he didn't make a business out of pretending to be a devotee to cheat others there's a big difference there. is it possible to follow Krishna consciousness together with Vallabhacharya's Anugraha Marg if you can find anyone who's practicing in the way that Vallabha 
taught, yes. If not, no. If you can find, very good. In Bahrain there used to be one Pushti Magi lady. She moved back to India. But she told me, she said, I like your Iskon gurus better than our gurus. Because they come here, they give a little Qatar and they spend the rest of the time shopping. And they have an arrangement with the customs in Bombay. They bring their, all their overweight, all their goods back in. without They pay them off or something. She said, Whereas you, you spend all your time only doing bhakti and only preaching to others. She said, I like your gurus better than our gurus. So if you can find someone who is actually preaching Krishna consciousness in Vallab Sampradaya for the benefit of others, out of a desire to praise Krishna and not in not enjoy Krishna who if he goes in your home and sees your Lala in one corner and the TV in the other will tell you to throw out the TV and only worship Lala if you can find any such person then you can do Krishna consciousness along with what Iskon teaches I haven't seen anyone to date if you can find all well and good please let me know Krishna never provided such groups like Iskon, Madhvacharya, the message which was just which the message which was just chant my name. Then why differences? Who said this? I can't exactly understand the question. Please don't be shy. Even if you you're afraid of what I'll reply. Um, <laughs> it's the point should be clarified. I can't uh, I can't understand what the question is actually. Maybe, maybe, this person maybe, but we don't know unless they say. Why don't you write the question in the language that you're more familiar with? Give it to someone who can translate it and then give it back to me. Because don't mind, it's not a fault, but the English, either my English is not good enough that I can't understand it, or your English is not good enough to be expressed very clearly. So. Whoever wrote this could please have it rewritten. Maybe in another session I'm coming back. I'm scheduled to come back on Saturday. Should we distribute books freely or should we charge? Prabhupada generally preferred that the books we people should pay something because he thought if you pay for something you you take it more seriously. But he wasn't against books being distributed freely if people can pay let them pay that's also they do some savor but we may do also we can give gifts and say, Diwali gifts wedding gifts we can give Prabhupada's books we can put in hospitals it's very good if you can put in hospitals so people are lying there sick they're feeling miserable they've got nothing to do so it's a good place we put books in hospitals. Maybe that won't be possible in Dubai. In other places can be done. Yeah. Guruma, like you have been mentioning quite some time in this lecture today that we should not be eating food from non devotees mm. who are eating meat in their house or of that sort. But there are many people who might not be eating meat and all that, but they might not be devotees or chanting, but they might be still offering to Krishna and serving what should we do that day? Well, there aren't that many people who are, who are offering their food to Krishna. Even who are coming in traditional sampradaya, just like they're asking about Vallabh sampradaya. But most people in Vallabh sampradaya, I don't think they offer all their food to Krishna. They offer a little milk in the morning or something. So if you, if you can find someone who's offering to Krishna, that's pretty rare. It's pretty, they have some commitment. That's pretty good. But, but you might, you, there are many people who are vegetarians who are not specifically devotees and it's, it's better also not to eat in their home um, unless they can be benefited by our doing so sometimes as preachers we go to people's homes who are vegetarians but they're not specifically um, devotees we may do I, I prefer not to but we may do also. Prabhupada actually said that we should go to, people should first become life members. He was talking about the preachers. You're 
also preachers, but in a different situation to those of sannyasi preachers. So, uh, again, social convention may be such that you may be constrained to do so. But then you can say that we will we'll offer the food to Krishna like this. But generally it's not recommended. Because Bishayer on the Kaile Dushta Hai Mon Mon Dushta Haile Nahe Krishna Shwaran Krishna Shwaran Na Haile Jivan Nishva. That if we eat food cooked non by, by non devotees, it's particul- particularly grains, then the mind becomes contaminated. If the mind becomes contaminated, we don't remember Krishna. If we don't remember Krishna, then our life is spoiled. Hare Krishna. I'll finish there. What if they are Mayavadis? Well, everyone who's not a devotee is a Mayavadi, more or less. 